So look, I know we touched on it, but I posit that this has one of the best, if not the best, finger and mouth scenes that I've seen to date. So are you intrigued? You should be. <laughs> Anyang SAO, welcome to Afternoona Delight, where Leah, Megan, and Amy, romance novelists and your K-Romance guides. So grab some deck bokey and listen to your new favorite unnees. Hey, everybody. Hello. Hi there. So it is the beginning of June and happy pride to you both and also um, all of our listeners, especially our queer and questioning listeners. So I love pride. Yeah. Happy, happy pride. pride. We're going to uh, the Santa Cruz Pride Parade on Sunday, and then they have a family day at our um, Museum of Art and History. So we're going to go and hang out with that, too. So, Oh, that's so cool. That sounds like a perfect Ugh. day. Whereas my town is like, oh, it's June? Well, we're just going to have a hot rod. <laughs> <laughs> traffic is <laughs> the traffic is so bad today because everyone's coming in for a hot rod weekend so yeah, is that yeah. like uh, yeah. muscle cars um they're like old-fashioned cars okay so like, come here, like yeah. 70 like i'm trying like when i think of a hot rod i think of like or like a yeah. ford like a old okay. like a ford model yeah, like, <laughs> yeah 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 like yeah i would say like more like 70s sometimes like obviously older like people can be rolling in and like you know, old Cadillacs and stuff like that. Okay. Well, I mean, look, there's a so, charm to that. No, it's it's very cool. And if you're into it, I, I just think it's funny that it's like, yay, pride. And then my town's like, hot rods. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I have one other uh, random Pennsylvania aside. So my son just finished uh, eighth grade, which was really funny because some Australian friends actually reached out seeing all the eighth grade graduation things. And one of them was like, pretty funny. And she's like, so... In America, do some kids just like finish in eighth grade and that's it? Because like there's so much festivity. Oh, that's so oh, because of graduation. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> I was like, no, actually, it was kind of funny. I was so much wanted to be like, yes, they do, and then we put them to work in the salt mines. But um, so anyway, uh, what's my train of thought here? I just had it and lost it. A pet Pennsylvania. Oh, yeah. Okay, so we were out for a graduation dinner, and my son's trip had done a trip for eighth grade graduation with the school to uh, both Washington, D.C. and then Pennsylvania. And he had become really taken by Amish country and also whoopie pies. But then they spent all day yesterday, like me, like all the parents who'd done the trip and the kids saying how amazing pretzels are in Pennsylvania. Oh, that is also a fact. We have the best soft pretzels here. Yeah. Well, so I mentioned, um, I or I no I didn't I didn't mention it on the podcast. Uh, so when we were all together for the the sugar concert and we um, left, and by the way, I had had like a lot of margaritas at the concert, and I was still like feeling good, but I was hungry. And they had in the parking lot as we were leaving the concert. They <laughs> I had know where these, you're going. I know where had, you're going. They had. This is related to soft pretzels. But anyway, so they had uh, these these people just like grilling hot dogs there on the grill. And they were bacon wrapped hot dogs. And you can get like fried like onions and peppers on them too. And I like made a beeline. <laughs> like I not, You I weren't like, alone. Like, you were not alone. No, because who came with me? You, I did. Yeah. You, you were yeah, throwing you elbows, getting so, people out of the way. <laughs> I was throwing bows to get my dog. I was like, oh my God. And I am telling you. So I was like, I, I you know, I ordered it. And I was like, I just want, you know, the hot dog with the bacon, obviously. And then ketchup. And he handed it to me, and it was ten dollars. <laughs> I love your reaction. Ten dollars for a hot dog, and I am a country bumpkin, <laughs> not really, but how much? I, how much like, I remember sheets. What can you get a hot dog for? Well, yeah. See, and then I remember. But those hot dogs and sheets are probably like a quarter the size. Like they this are. was a and big dog, a baby arm. But in my <laughs> in my drunk. In my drunk rambling, I kept going, I can get two for a dollar at cheese. You did. You you were so into the ten dollar hot dog, which it's but not it was, it's not ideal, but it's not no it's not I highway don't care. robbery. I probably would have paid fifty dollars for that hot dog. I'm serious. It was so good. At least it, it was, was good. If you're gonna delicious. pay ten dollars for a hot dog, it, it better be good. It was good. It was good. I was yeah. I was delighted. And, 
so it was, it was just funny because I like obviously told Neil about it because in Pennsylvania, going like into stadiums, like especially if you go to a Phillies game or um, an Eagles game in in Philadelphia, um, they sell hot dogs on the street. So, uh, or oh my god, they sell soft pretzels on the street, and those are the best soft pretzels. They just it's just like in a box, <laughs> and they are. Incredible. I feel like we so need I, to I, weigh I, I in on these about. pretzels. Like I, I need to. Like I, I, I like soft but pretzels. But how can I send? No, you, you a can't. Good... Like I have to. We'd have to go there. You got to eat it fresh. I don't want like a stale Pennsylvania box pretzel. <laughs> yeah, and and that's the thing. When you went to Wawa in Florida, I said get the soft pretzels. But they're but not going to the be Pennsylvania pretzels. They're no. not. They're not the like Pennsylvania brand because that's. That's so I would love to compare it to Michigan soft pretzels because I grew up in Washtenaw County, which is a heavily German, um, like, migrant, like, a, and mm. I come from, you know, in some percentage of that stock of, like, German peasants. But anyway, mm. German pretzels are a big deal. Same. And the, I have a very particular, like, bent on how I like my soft pretzels, and I like mine to be a little bit wet. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yes, Yes, I actually do. Yeah, because I feel like they can be dry. Like on yes, the outside, they can be very the dry. ones that have like a like the crust has like, like a moist a, dough. Yeah, and like the brown just is a little bit wet. <laughs> yeah, no, I totally get what you mean, and I yeah, I agree. And yeah, we do have good soft pretzels, but I did, it was funny because I was at my farmer's market getting strawberries, and they had homemade whoopie pies, and I sent Leah. A, t- mm. a photo and said you can show Jarrah because it was like the whole display <laughs> well look I have a segue speaking of okay. things that are delicious to put in your mouth oh my god <laughs> <laughs> ah, that's so I know. all I could think about you all I could think about was you Leah with the fingers in the mouth so <laughs> I mean it was a good finger in the mouth right it was a good finger in the- I mean I don't know how she massage that tooth down to not she had a thimble. Chirp, but she put a thimble. Huh? She put a thimble. I know, but like without like that would I would like crawl out of my skin if somebody was rubbing a thimble on my tooth. Well let's get to it because if you're listening and you don't know what we're talking about, <laughs> we'll get to the finger in the mouth and the thimble. Um so what we're talking about today is the handmaiden. And that is a 2016 South Korean erotic psychological thriller mm-hmm. Directed by Park Chan Wook of Old Boy fame, and look, this movie is equal parts mindfuckery and visual feast. <laughs> the TLDR plot is essentially how a poor Korean con man pretends to be a Japanese count to seduce an heiress and enlists a scrappy pickpocket to help him in his endeavors. But nothing is what it seems in this three-part story. There are more twists and turns than a Six Flags roller coaster. And by the time you're done, you might never look at octopus, mannequins, thimbles, or silver balls the same way again. Set mostly in 1930s Korea during the Japanese occupation, this is a boldly provocative tale that explores themes of class, gender, and sexuality in a way that is both thought-provoking and emotionally charged in a manner that will leave you pondering after you finish. So Rotten Tomatoes gives The Handmaid a stellar 96% approval rating, certifying it fresh, and leads and Kim Tae-ri of Mr. Sunshine and 2521 fame, as well as Kim Min-hee, Ha Jung-woo, and Signal star Cho Ji-woon. This whole movie was inspired by a 2002 novel, which I have not read and really want to, called Fingersmith by Welsh writer Sarah Waters. And the setting gets changed from Victorian era Britain to Korea under Japanese colonial rule. And this film was also selected to compete in the Palme d'Or at the 2016 Cannes Film Festival. So look, I know we touched on it, but I posit that this has one of the best, if not the best, finger in mouth scenes that I've seen to date. So are you intrigued? You should be. (laughs) So first, we're going to get into a non-spoiler section. Um, Let's get some potential triggers out of the way. This movie is an SFW. You do not want to watch if kids could wander into the room. This happened to... So I first heard about this movie from a friend who just is in my real life. 
who was like, I had this very uncomfortable situation where I popped on this movie. It's a Korean movie. You might be interested in it. But my daughter came in the room during like an extended sex scene and it was super awkward. So I really just say, don't don't turn it on if, you know, kids are going to be home and coming in. Um, there are a number of long and explicit lesbian sex scenes, all of which are consensual. Um, more darkly, there's child abuse, attempted rape, violence, sexual exploitation, and an octopus that might have been requested to do some deeply questionable things. There's genitalia in jars, perverts galore, and a scene of torture, although the character does sort of deserve what he gets. So thoughts on the content and what you found in this film versus like an average K-drama. So first of all, as far as like the triggers, I felt very prepared <laughs> for the content, thanks to you and your detailed, um, I don't want to call them warnings because I don't, I mean, the warning is don't watch this with your kids around, yeah. but there's, you know, so there's some really good content here. Um, so I, I watch this hundred percent by myself and rightfully so. And I don't think... I don't think there's a comparison to K-drama as far as what you might see on the screen in one versus another. Like, pretty much nothing that you see on the screen in The Handmaiden could ever be shown on the screen in a K-drama. Um, the only similarity I found, which I did enjoy, was the use of big reveals by switching points of view and showing the same scene through a different character. So if you like that sort of conceit, um, I liked that a lot, and I think that's a uh, similarity that we do see in a lot of K-dramas. Mm -hmm. And I just think that, like, if you've seen mostly dramas or only dramas and then you switch over to Korean film, just be prepared. They're not the same. And uh, <laughs> they can just go a lot more explicit in terms of violence. Not so much in this one, but in others. Um, or in sexual content. And so I think it's just something to be prepared for. Like, if you're used to seeing, like, Kim tae potentially, like, never even, like, kiss a love interest in Mr. Sunshine... Well, you know, she does in this. Yeah, it's, you know, I feel like I've seen uh, several K movies now, and a lot of them just give me this uncomfortable feeling. And I don't say that in a negative way. Um, I sort of have to, like, sit with that uncomfortableness. Like, it just kind of makes you, I don't know, question things. And, uh, you know, it reminds me, I mean, Parasite had that same... Yeah. Uh, it's like the atmosphere or the aura of it that it just kind of like puts you on edge. Um, uh, Night in Paradise, which is another K movie I saw same. It was explicitly violent. Um, and it just, yeah, again, had this like overriding, like uncomfortable feeling. And to a degree, Handmaiden did too. Um, but again, in like a good way, it, I don't, I know, like, we're supposed to describe things, but it's really hard for me to describe how sometimes K-movies make me feel. But, yeah, not like K-dramas. Unless you're talking about, I would say the only thing that's comparable is the whole vibe of Strangers from Hell. And I'm not saying that this this movie is like that, but it's just that type of, like, sort of, like, raw atmosphere. Yeah, fair. So, overall, would you say that you know, going into this, because I was the one who, like, I we put this to Patreon and let them vote for a film, and I was really hoping it was going to be The Handmaiden, and I was really happy that it was. Um, but did you, either of you, did you expect to enjoy this movie? Um, and how did your expectation match the reality of your experience? Yeah, I actually want to, I just want to, if it's okay mm -hmm. if I jump yeah. in. I want to say, okay, I did not, I don't really like knowing about movies, especially movies because they're so short before I watch a movie. I kind of like going in blind. And just based on like what you said in some of the trailers, which you did, like you sold it well. I just still expected this kind of like quieter, like introspective uh, and where maybe the characters are like grappling with like same sex feelings. Like that's what I thought I was getting. And so it's not that. No. <laughs> it's like this like clever plot there's intrigue there's murder there's like creepy perverted uncles there's it's just a really clever plot told from several different points of view you don't really know who's the good guy sometimes you're not sure of people's motives and i loved it it was so twisty and fun and then like sexy on top of it um yeah i 
so my expectations were um i expected to like it and i liked it even more than i expected and i'm pretty much in the same boat like leah the only thing you really told us about was the the sex in it like you didn't give away story which i think is good because this is not a movie where you want to give away story so i had and i like i even looked up the description of it and so i knew that there was like a con artist type aspect to it but i had no idea how sort of how how good and twisty it was going to be um i d- i didn't have any expectations of whether or not i would like it because i didn't know the story um and then i was pleasantly surprised with the story because i thought i knew what was happening and then they'd switch to another point of view and i would think i would know what was happening and then nope you get another point of view and i was totally wrong and i really love that i love things that are super clever that i think i know and then i find out that the movie know it was more clever than i was yeah i'm glad that leah didn't spoil anything like i'm i'm glad because she got me to watch she knew how to get me to watch it you know what i mean like or to get us to watch it so i'm really glad that like nothing was really um revealed about it because i was super surprised then like when like twisty stuff was happening i was completely caught off guard and i love i am preening right now so you can keep that praise a comment (laughs) so (laughs) um so got like i'd say this is a gothic story and gothic stories are defined as a genre that's dark eerie mysterious and can often contain elements of terror horror the macabre or bizarre um And some of the themes and motifs in Gothics include ideas around power, confinement, and isolation. And, um, you know, ones that spring to mind are kind of Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte or Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte or maybe Northanger Abbey by Jane Austen or The Picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde. Maybe some of or a lot of Edgar Allan Poe. (laughs) So are you a fan of the Gothic genre? And... um, you know, what's a way that the handmaiden fits within that genre conventions? And I'm just going to spoil it and say, I am a giant Gothic fan. I mean, I, it's my happy place. And I like anything that has like Gothic adjacent qualities. Like I grew up as like my coming of age, middle school, probably like not recommended reading was like vc andrews <laughs> yeah it was just i was like is she gonna say flower in the flowers yeah, in, the flowers attic? in the attic that's exactly where more i'm going so i loved heaven which had like a maze with like the uncle who was the toy maker who lived in the middle of the maze and you know i mean obviously vc andrews is like incest galore issues so yeah they were always just dark and twisty and who's locked in what you know attic or who's in what maze and you know i don't know i just like it yeah, I, I love it. Like, Wuthering Heights, as problematic of a love story as it might be, mm-hmm. has always been one of my favorite gothic novels. And for those of you youngins out there who only know Ray Fiennes as Voldemort or He Who Shall Not Be Named, you need to go watch him as Heathcliff in the 1992 film adaptation because, wow, like, yeah. But as for how as for The Handmaiden, like, fitting into this gothic genre, like, one of our heroines, Hideko who I, oh my gosh, I loved Kim Min Hee. Like, she was amazing. She's a prisoner in her own home, forced to read and enact erotic stories for her uncle and his pervy high society cronies. Like, it's not just that she's a prisoner, but she has to do some icky things. Oh, yeah. And we're going to get into that in the spoiler section. It's so yeah. icky. Oh, you know what? I just want to say, as we were talking about Hideko, who I loved, and again, played to perfection, um, I feel like her and Ko Moon Young... <laughs> yeah get along yeah Don't they kind of have a little bit of the same vibes they have like really beautiful fashion um they i mean for different reasons but both of them obviously have like trauma that has uh produced their personality traits and yeah yeah so i, I thought, think that um like, Hideko is probably a little bit more like she's not wearing some of her uh social uh I'm trying to think of like what the best word is because it's not like her like uh anti-social tendencies on her sleeve she's more she's had to survive by tamping them down more whereas Komi Young I think yeah. has been able to like have hers be like what she's leading with often but yeah very similar in terms of uh raised with a lot of trauma and problematic you know parenting or guardianships yeah 
Yeah. Well, I guess I also was like, I would think it would be cool to put them in the same room and see what they would see. Put them in their big, uh, fancy, dark, depressing house with a screaming, with a screaming right. deer outside or an octopus in the basement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so without getting into specifics, because we're in the non-spoiler section, we have kind of given a nod to the fact that this film has a non-linear timeline and, you know, some unreliable narratives. But when we're talking about nonlinear timelines, uh, you know, it's told out of chronological order. So that's using things like flashbacks or flash forwards and other popular movies like Pulp Fiction or Memento or Citizen Kane are examples of films with nonlinear storytelling. So do you enjoy stories that do this and how did it work or not work for you in regards to this film, generally speaking? Okay. So I have a quick Excuse me, bubble in my throat. I have a quick Memento story. It's very quick because thinking... So if anybody has seen Memento, it the main character, played by Guy Pierce, is a guy who has short-term memory loss. And so he's got like tattoos all over his body to remember things because he's trying to figure something out. So that's the total TLDR because it's been years since I've seen it. But when I did watch Memento, this is way, 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 way back in the day where I rented it from Blockbuster. <laughs> And I was watching it with my ex-husband and we're watching it and we knew it was like a nonlinear thing, but we're like, this is like really confusing. Like I can't piece anything together. And we look at the DVD and the back of the DVD is like royally scratched up. So not only was this a nonlinear movie, but it was jumping around oh on the DVD. <laughs> Oh, because we God. returned it. It is hard to follow. We returned it and got a new one, and it was a totally different experience. <laughs> oh, that's crazy. Oh, back in the days when I late, scratched Late the 90s, and... late 90s, yeah. But a fan- I think I watched it on DVD, too. Yeah, but a fantastic movie, and I loved it. And I do love these mm-hmm. kinds of stories. Like, oh, my gosh, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, one of my favorites. Um, I just watched 500 Days of Summer with my daughter recently, oh. which is a great um, love story, nonlinear thing, and it – Just so much fun. Yeah, I love it because, again, I like when things are clever, and I think that I'm more clever and then find out that I'm not. Like, I want something that's going to keep me on my toes, and this kind of storytelling really does that when it's done well. And I think it was done really well in in this drama. And because we're in the non-spoiler section, I won't talk about the exact scene and all the details, but the hospital scene, I was like, ooh. And then I was like, ooh, I've got to figure it out. Then I'm like, ooh, no, I don't. (laughs) Um, And that was really good. It was really good. Yeah, I loved it. It felt almost like a better version of Atonement. I don't know if you guys either read or watched Atonement. Um, that movie and book pissed me off. <laughs> it was done really well, but it made me so sad and angry. Uh, and this movie didn't. It was just damn good and twisty. And I, I, and the thing is, again, I didn't know it was going to be multiple points of view. And about like 45 minutes into the movie, I was like, is this the end? I was so confused. I was like, is this the end? And then all of a sudden, kind of the point of view changes and uh, and like reverts back. And I was like, oh, my God, this is so cool. I mean, I was so stoked. I really loved it. It was just so smart. And it's interesting to go into a movie not knowing that it's going to do that, right? No like idea. 500 Days of Summer, Eternal Sunshine. Like, I knew those things were going to be weird and jump around. I had no idea in this. So, yeah, I really loved because that was a big reveal was the fact that, nope, you don't know the whole story. We're going to go back and retell it. Well, and you also don't know who to trust. Right. You don't know people's, again, you don't know their motivations. Uh, you don't know, like, their end game. I didn't trust anybody you, yeah. until the end. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, true. <laughs> I, I just, like, I just love my girls. Yeah. And I was like, please, I know. please. You I know. know. So now it's time for everyone's favorite segment. It's the K-pop wreck of the week. And this week we have Leah. All right. So like we said, uh, it's Pride Month. So we really, you know, we have, we're doing uh, The Handmaiden. And then we also wanted to, you know, make sure that we're purifying our K-pop list too. So um, we want to give a shout out to a group, QIX. And they're a rookie queer idol group. And I love their independent label name, which is Sweet Potato Productions. And they're four members uh, who are non-binary, gender fluid, gender queer. And uh, they debuted in November 12th, 2022. So they're newbies on the block. And their debut single is Lights Up. 
which is really catchy and it's empowering. And um, and when they debuted, they actually debuted at um, a trans right organization, Joe Gakpo's Transgender Day of Remembrance, which is really cool. And basically the members felt like they didn't really feel like the K-pop industry uh, was accepting of their identity or appearances. So the song is really about being, um, you know, unafraid and reclaiming their space. So we recommend Lights Up by QIX. And I just want to throw in one more uh, rec of a, I'm going to, I'm actually going to recommend a Thai pop group. Um, I've recommended them to Lee and Amy before, but they're called Four Mix. So the number four and then M-I-X. And they um, consist of four members. And um, I don't like know their identities, but they call themselves an LGBTQ group. Um, they're very, especially active during Pride. Um, they, uh, um, and their songs are so catchy and I love them. Uh, my favorite is Why You Come Back. It's fantastic. It's from 2021. Um, so yeah, check them out as well if you're looking to kind of, uh, diversify your, uh, Asian pop experience. <laughs> If you enjoy our podcast, you have our patrons to thank, at least in part. Afternoon of Delight Patreon allows us to keep creating content for y'all to enjoy. Thank you so much to everyone who is supporting us there. And not to brag, but our Patreon community is pretty awesome. And you can join at a tier that feels good to you. Gain access to fun perks like K-drama posts, monthly Patreon-only bonus podcasts, and even a live K-drama support group on Zoom because we know firsthand what it's like to have no one to talk to about those crazy plot twists, amazing characters, and all those feelings. And look, no one should have to walk that walk alone. So learn more by visiting afternoonadelight.com. That's www.afternoonadelight.com. And hey, while you're on the website, you can check out Afternoon A Delight podcast merch, find links to book recommendations, bop along to our K-pop Rex, blow up your skin with k merch Rex, find all of our social media and a link to our email so you can send us recommendations or feedback. And hey, while you're at it, why don't you pop over to Spotify or Apple Podcasts and leave us a five-star review? It really helps with our discoverability. Gamsamnida. So what kinds of things do you both like to do when you drive? Pay attention to the road? Is this a trick question? All right, how about when you fold laundry? Why am I folding laundry in this scenario? Read, friends. I was trying to get you to say read. You could just ask us if we like to read when we drive or... Wait, how are you reading when you're driving? With Audible. You know, our sponsor, who is the leading creator and provider of premium audio storytelling, enriching the lives of millions of listeners every day. I listen to audiobooks on my commute to work in the car. Oh, yeah, I totally do that. I love my Audible subscription. Then why'd you leave me hanging with the whole driving thing? Forget it. It's not important. What is important is that now our listeners can get a 30-day free trial of Audible Premium Plus from Afternoon of Delight. Do you know what they get with that free trial? Actually, I do. They get one audiobook credit, two if they are Prime members, which is good for any premium selection and they get to keep that audiobook. They also get the whole Audible Plus catalog of podcasts like Afternoon of Delight, audiobooks, guided wellness, and Audible Originals. And with the Plus catalog, you can listen all you want, no credits needed. And Audible sends you a reminder email before your trial ends. Sounds like a great way to spend 30 days to me, especially if you're heading outside for a walk, have a long commute to work, or just want to hear one of many talented narrators really bring your book to life. All you have to do is go to www.audibletrial.com slash afternoona to sign up and you're ready to download your first listen. Enjoy. Okay, so we are now in the spoiler section. So look, at the heart of this story is a lesbian love story. 
And I, in doing, you know, reading and prep for the drama uh, or for the podcast today, uh, I was scouring different spots. And, you know, sometimes I like to go see what people are saying over on Reddit. It can be interesting. It can be a spot for critique. And a comment caught my eye. And it was um, one that I kind of wanted to talk about with you. And so it is this, and this is verbatim. My one major criticism of the movie is the persistent male gaze. Couldn't Pac have just like consulted a lesbian? The scissoring, the bells, and the other sex scenes felt like some clueless man's idea of what women enjoy about sex. And the way the scenes were framed kept you ever conscious of the camera. The love scenes are more in the blue is the warmest color category, definitely made for a man's enjoyment, than say, portrait of a lady on fire, moi, best ever, because of this alone. So what say you? Did the lesbian scenes feel very overly male gaze and exploitative kind of? Yes or no? So I don't think that, like, I don't, I, I'm i cishet, right? I don't know what lesbian sex is like. So I don't feel like I can comment to how realistic it was. Like, like you know, with this person saying, you know, why didn't they ask a lesbian, like saying that they like this and they like this. And I do appreciate that. The idea that I don't know if I'm watching what two women really want to do with each other, right? I found it sexy still, um, but I can totally see both sides of it, and I can see there being some critique there. Um, so yeah, I'm kind of torn. I don't really know how I don't really know how I feel whether or not I feel like this is a male gaze or not because I'm speaking as a cishet woman. And I enjoyed looking at them and I enjoyed their intimacy and I enjoy that their intimacy happened with them and them alone, right? That the men didn't like with the, with the, with Hideko reading the stories and sort of enacting the sexual positions with that creepy wooden dummy thing. Oh my God. <laughs> like nightmarish. Um, but like the men separated from her from, you know, with like this like moat kind of thing and you can tell that they're all like they're all squirming like just watching her read this stuff um and you know popping woody's right and left but they don't get to touch her right and i think that that's important um so yeah i don't i i really am torn but like with you you know sort of putting it out there and researching i wanted to see what i wanted to see if there's anything from like the director himself and the director does address this and again i don't know how i feel about it but i want he, like an interviewer. So in an interview, um, okay. It's an interview from the film stage.com by Nick Newman from 2016. And also I'm just kind of chuckling cause it's a man asking a man about this, <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. but he says, I read in an interview with you that that was conducted by someone who found the handmaiden's male gaze troubling. Have many people spoken to you about those matters after seeing the film? And this is what the director says. You know how important these reading sessions that Hideko is a part of are for this film? These scenes are designed to literally show what male gaze is, and in a very palpable manner, it shows you what the violence of gaze can do. Even if Hideko wasn't wearing layers of kimono, it doesn't matter. She might as well have been exposed in the nude in front of those men. So rather than touch her, these men are meters away from the stage where she's giving the reading, but in these reading sessions, they might as well have been gang raping her. So for a filmmaker who is trying to make a film about the violence of the male gaze and to make a movie that is a criticism of these kinds of violent, of this kind of violent male gaze, really how careful we have been and how much thought we have to put into designing these scenes of Hideko, who's been the subject of such violent male gaze all her life. And when she finds her true love and has the moment of love and makes love, how careful would I have been not to make that moment yet another object of voyeuristic male gaze? So, I don't know. I don't know. I think that I, I still I come, I come at this from the point of I am not queer, and so I don't know how I'm supposed to react to that sex scene. But I can say that when I was watching it, I, I found it sexy. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I'm the same as you. Uh, so it's hard for me to also critique that. I mean, I will say I've seen female on female like porn that's made by like the porn industry, and that's 
often to me a male gaze and is much more noticeable as a male gaze than this movie. Um, I felt it was sexy and I felt it was like beautiful as well. Um, I didn't, I wasn't like cringing when I watched these scenes. Um, so, I mean, and sometimes I just have to go like a little bit off a of feeling like does me like as a woman, does this make me feel like exploited or, um, you know, so yeah, maybe I was just going off of vibes that I didn't feel that way, but it's also a fair critique, like to totally. But then, you know, I mean, I do have to say though, is sex on screen ever realistic? Like, are we, <laughs> is like straight sex on scene realistic? Are they con like, they're clearly not consulting women for straight sex on scene sometimes <laughs> based on what we're seeing. So, um, I mean, is it maybe like sensationalist? Sure. I will say, I like that. I like the idea of him saying, I like the, the idea of him acknowledging that her doing those readings in front of men was, was, was basically rape because it was terrible and it was, and it was so uncomfortable and I hated it so much. Um, and it didn't matter if she was clothed or not. Ugh, so uncomfortable. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I do think there was a, there was a difference in obviously how she was treated, uh, by Suki, um, than to how she was treated by literally everyone else in her life. So yeah, I mean, I don't know. I can't, yeah, I can't speak for that either. All I can say is, you know, it's hard to see any kind of realistic depictions of even like a female orgasm on screen. So, yeah, I mean, I think here's what the things that I want to think about is, you know, if we're going to be explicit about it, which look, this is an explicit film. So I feel like that's okay. Um, to me, a lot of it felt like, like, first of all, I want to acknowledge that like, I didn't have the ick, right? Like I wasn't like, oh my God, I'm watching this as like a performative ick that feels like it's very much centering like male joy here. I felt like it really did center female joy. And, um, and a lot of the sex scenes were things that, are going to be involved in women giving pleasure. Like there was an extended 69 scene where like that is going to be like, that's going to feel good. <laughs> and <laughs> um, I mean, like I'm just yeah. putting it out there. Um, and yeah. you know, there was a lot of like body exploration and things like that. So the things I guess that I will like pull out, if I'm going to like call out like the two items that I feel like might feel more kind of performative we're also like visually arresting. So it's the extended scissoring scene. And I know that that can be like a controversial, like, you know, <laughs> like sex move that gets, I think a lot of uh, attention in that like male gaze pornographic industry, which so I can see can like cause some trouble. Like I could see they're causing some consternation. Um, something I liked in the scissoring scene is um, I actually really liked when they like clasped hands Thank you. I was just going to say that. And they, and they like looked at each other with like love and yeah. joy. It didn't feel gross. It was very it intimate. Like, exploitive gross. It felt it celebrative, felt, if you will. <laughs> yes. I, I actually love that. And also good for balance. I, think I, I was all... also like, actually physically, that would <laughs> yeah. make it better too. Because <laughs> you need to like get the angle. Yeah, for the for the best torque. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> so I was like, ten out of ten, that felt like actually a common sense to me enough that I was like, this resonates. <laughs> right. Um, and then I will say, like the what, like the one that felt a little bit more like on the nose, but look at that point, I was just happy with it. Was the bells at the end? So I'm giving the scissoring a pass. I felt like the torque was fine. Um, but the bells at the end were like basic. But what I liked was that the bells had been seen as like a tool of kind of that male gaze and that tool of male pleasure. And essentially they're like these balls that you, you know, stick up. They're like the Benoit yeah, you balls. you put them in your vagina. And, um, you know, mm -hmm. in one of the erotic stories that Hideko is forced to read, essentially like, you know, you put your jade gate on another person's jade gate. And if you get the torque right, the bells will sing together. And so we see as the camera like pans out to the boat, taking the women to freedom, we hear the cell, the soft tinkling of the silver bells. And I was like, you know what? Honestly, it works for me. Like, did I fully need to have them like both like butt naked throwing the bells up each other's like, you know, vaginas at the end? Honestly, kind of. Yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, 
like, I yeah. mean, like yeah, honestly, yeah. I was fine with Do you know what, though? It's also, it's a literary call-out. Like, that's good plotting. Yeah. Like, you know, like, right. that, it, it's a call-out to something that happened more violently earlier in the story, and here's them taking their, it, they have agency yeah. in this. Yeah, they took back the power of the Silver Bells. So, yeah, for a, from a literary standpoint and from a writing standpoint, I I loved I love the bells. I thought like as a that was kind of like almost like a final parting scene. And I was like, "Fuck yeah." <laughs> because to me I was looking at it less as a sexual thing as and more as a like power thing. Like we're taking the power back from these bells that were used in such a violent way. Yeah. And so here okay, so the, I want to kind of explore this a little bit further with a second part, which is something that I was kind of fascinated by, which was how did Hideko and Suki's mothering analogies work or not work for you? This occurred kind of with like a kink factor layered onto it. Like Suki claiming that Hideko is like her baby that she gets to bathe or dress. Um, or during like, you know, their first kind of protracted lovemaking, even wishing out loud that she could give her milk from her breasts. I mean, I support whatever anyone's kink is as long as it's consensual, but I myself am not into infantilizing a partner, but I do get the connection here because they're both like pretty much orphans who've had terrible upbringings and have never had that true maternal love. And so they're seeking from their partner what they're both lacking and it works for them. Yeah. I'm sort of like, I sort of have the same take as Amy as I was like, look, they're happy doing it. Like, that's good. It's good with me. Like, it's not my thing, but I, I appreciated it because they both seemed to enjoy it. And it both seemed to be ma like maybe healing their inner child in a way. And it was consensual and beautiful. And, and yeah, for me, it felt like Suki was really kind of driving that narrative, you know, like she was the one that was like, you know, I get to wash this pretty baby. I get to dress this pretty baby. I get to like, you know, have this pretty baby essentially like nurse on me. And, um, yeah, I mean, like, I was trying to think about it in terms of this being, like, from the male gaze perspective, like, okay, now we're layering on this, like, idea of, like, what would be seen as, like, ultimate femininity in some ways, which is, like, that idea of motherhood, which, look, I do not agree with, but I'm just saying, like, society-wise, that can often be, like, you know, you're told that, like, your purpose in, like, being a woman can be, like, reproduction. We see that as, like, why there's, like, tools of reproductive violence happening and, like, women not having agencies on their body because we're told that our worth is through breeding. And so layering that into like sex acts, I was trying to be like, does this hit me weird or bad? And again, it did not. And this is all surprising to me because like, if you told me like, here's a drama that has like scissoring and like mother as like also sex maker, like I would be, and it was directed by a man. I'd be like, oh man, absolutely. This is going to be garbage. <laughs> and I it's know. not to me. I think that they no. did. A, I want to say good job, honestly. Like, I don't feel like it's done. I don't feel like it feels like it was done by a woman, but it felt like it was done by a man who's not at least in this case, not totally icky. And look, if you are a male identified listener, I'm not trying to come at all men. So don't, you know, like, but I kind of do a lot of the time come for men. <laughs> like it's, a, you know, it's a lot. And, you know, I'm tired of listening to men talking a lot of the time, not always, but a lot of the time. Yes. And I'm tired of like their thought critique. <laughs> and I've been like watching like the idol coming down the pipeline. Like that's going to be on like HBO max or whatever. And like, you know, I am interested, maybe, I'm also not interested, like, I kind of go between the two, like, do I want to see how much I'm going to not like it, or what? But that idea of just, like, that, like, heavy male gaze, and, like, that shock value, and using women's bodies to, like, make these bold statements, it just feels like it always makes me just be like, fuck off, like, no. And in this case, none of those buttons got triggered. And that is a refreshing yeah, experience. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I I know that there was a drama we watched in the past, and I it gave me immediate red flags, and I said, this was written by a man. And now I can't remember which drama it was, and that's going to bother me. I'll think about it. But uh, um, this drama, I think I, I knew it was written by a man before I started watching it, but it didn't give me, yeah, of course, it didn't give me, like, the ick 
in in any sort of way and i just feel like as you know like female presenting like persons all of us like we like know when the ick is there right like we've all had the ick. it's a gut reaction and yes so, yeah and sometimes it's just on vibes it well really okay is. the source material is written by a woman i was just gonna say that and so i think that's <laughs> important yeah. and um okay. And then it was adapted by the um, the director, Pak Chanwook. And I'm actually going to check and see because there's also a secondary adaptation writer on this. And I'm going to actually look up and see if I can. Not that I mean like I need to genderize the world, but I am just curious as like a thought exercise here. Um, yeah, so uh, the co-writer is um, a woman. Okay. Mm, okay. And yeah, so, well, then, um, and also out. was the writer on decision to leave. Um, so look, good. <laughs> I want to see like collaborations that feel more healthy to me and feel thoughtful. And I like the idea that there was like a very clear POV of like when men are enacting violence on female bodies via through their gaze, through their power, through their control, through their plots, through their attempts at rape, <laughs> um, and how good I want men to be part of that critique because we're never going to advance if we don't have men actually like being part of that conversation and part of that critique, I guess. Right. Um, so speaking of this, there's a lot of female rage in this film, which again, I love it that like, you know, this is something where we can center the idea of female rage and it's not just something that's being handled by women. Um, so while men were at the creative helm in terms of direction, how do you feel like the idea of female rage was executed and presented on screen? I mean, the men are destroyed. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like when, when Suki starts destroying the books, the his prayer rushes books, oh my gosh, I wanted to like hoot and holler and clap. Like that was amazing. And the only time we will, we will like, I was going to say, I was going to say, and even watching them destroy one. books, yeah, I was which like, should be painful. I was like, no, this is amazing. Like, I was like, burn them. Yes. Yeah. But then my whole thought was, God, please let them escape after they do this because. Oh, right. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I didn't, I mean, it ends with the happily ever after, which I know I'm getting it, but like, I was so freaking thrilled with that. Like, you have no idea. I was like, oh, this is going to end tragically. It's a freaking Korean movie. You know, everyone's going to die. And I mean, some people died, but I was rooting for that. Um, but yeah, I loved the <laughs> Kim tae is the cutest thing. <laughs> her little like stomps in her bare feet as she's like destroying <laughs> these books. Oh my gosh. I just, I love her. I, and it's like to see her, to, to know that this was like an early work of hers, either her first or one of the early works. She is just such a, such a talent. Oh my God. I, you know, because she was incredible in Mr. Sunshine. She was incredible in 2521. And it's just like, she's amazing. So I talked less about rage, but. I'm so I just want to talk about, about part that filled me with rage. <laughs> so okay. there's a scene where young Hideko and her aunt who takes her own life are like practicing reading for pervert uncle, basically. Ugh. And this young girl is like going through like eyes, nose, mouth, and then like, you know, gets to like, you know, penis, vagina, which is where the uncle wants it to go because he's horrible. And they yeah. start to giggle because like the photos are really or the photos the illustrations in the book are explicit and look honestly dicks are funny like it, they look funny <laughs> so they're like kind of giggling at it so she says the words and then she giggles horrible disgusting worst person ever uncle comes over with his black gloves grabs both the women by their faces and like oh. basically prevents them from breathing as he just kind of like he has each face in his hands and he's just kind of like shaking their heads like rag dolls and you know they can't breathe because he's got this like leathery glove like pressed over their nose and mouth and then he like releases it and it's this idea like that to giggle at the like nonsense of it and like the fact that honestly dicks are funny and weird um is that it like diminished him in that moment 
and he just couldn't fucking handle it. Right. And so he goes over and just enacts immediate violence on them. And it was just this like quick flash where I was just like, Oh my God. Like I, you know, that idea that like when a man can't laugh at themselves or laugh at the situation and all their shit just has to be the most serious and the most important. And that idea that even like a giggle is going to like undermine and ruin everything. So then they react with like violence. I'm like, I know what that, like, I don't like my husband's not doing that to me, but I mean, I feel like that's how it is to like walk through this world as a woman. (laughs) And so like, it just got me in that. And so yes, at the end when like she decides to like, you know, double cross the count and kisses it. He thinks he's like getting his as she's like kissing the wine into his mouth that she's like filled with, you know, the opium that's going to knock him out. I was really happy. Like that was to me, like, you know, he wakes up on the floor, ass to the sky with the two samurai sitting there ready to like, you know, take him into custody. And then what I liked was that like, that was her, like, you know, she was able to like take all that rage, get her win. And then the violence that actually ends up taking down like the two villain men at the end are each other. Like the men just like, yeah, yeah they do, do it, it themselves. themselves. They kill each yep. other basically. Yep. Mm-hmm. You know what? That, the the giggling at the drawings thing just made me think of going back to the bells for just a second is in another scene he makes her put a bell in her mouth mm-hmm. when she's a kid and then he beats her knuckles mm-hmm. with other bells because she talked back um so i feel like that's another you know taking back the power yeah. with the bell scene at the end is yeah absolutely you know those those bells were used for violence before and now they're not oh yeah i mean that's i I should have explained. Yeah, that's definitely what I meant. I forgot about the one where it's actually in the the story. But I was thinking of, yeah, he makes her, like, put it in her mouth, which in itself is a little erotic. Like, he clearly is, like, getting off They're vagina bells. And then he puts it in her other leg. He's so... Oh, he's so He's so bad. (laughs) Yeah, what's even the same... Just the same idea, like, you know, you know that there's certain situations where you want to say no to a man, and you don't feel, like, safe saying no. And, um... I guess that's kind of like they, because you know that there's this like rage that could be enacted. Um, so I'm happy to skip. Like we're at time, but I do want to talk yeah, about the that's... basement. Yeah, okay. yeah. So let's let's just I, before we go, I got to talk about the basement because <laughs> Justin Timberlake and Andy Samberg really had nothing on pervert <laughs> uncle for the idea of a dick in the box. So what the fuck was with the little shop of horrors in the basement? And the octopus whose ink the uncle presumably is licking for most of the drama, giving him that Ugh. black tongue. <laughs> uh, I did not even put that together, by the way. The octopus ink and his black tongue. I didn't put that the ink thing together until you said that here. So first of all, this the octopus, just so everybody knows, when we record together on our platform that we're on, we have to put in a name and we always put in a name having to do with whatever drama or whatever we're talking about. And we don't know what names everybody's going to put. And everybody today put a name having to do with the octopus. So mine was, mine is hashtag justice for octopus. Leah, what's yours? Um, mine is, oh gosh, Octomom. <laughs> and Megan? Mine is innocent octopus because I really feel like that poor octopus is 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 innocent in all things. Yeah. But as, as far as the basement goes, like... The the ink looking was so creepy, and then finding out it's this giant octopus in the basement that could not have possibly survived in that ill-fitting tank, like, mm-hmm. all the ick. And when the Count kills himself and the uncle with the mercury cigarettes, although he probably would have bled out after all of the fingers in one of his hands have been chopped off with a paper cutter. Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. <laughs> right. And he's about to castrate mm-hmm. him. Yes, he's about to castrate him. His last words are, well, are basically, well, at least I get to die with my dick still attached. Which, of course, that's the last thing he thinks Yes, about. well, that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. That solidifies the importance of men retaining their manhood at all costs. And if creepy uncle cuts off his dick, he literally wins the pissing contest, right? Like, his trophy, that he is the apex predator, alpha male, whatever you want to call him, is that he has that dick in a jar. <laughs> Alongside the many other dicks like, and vaginas that are in jars. Yes. I I don't that was like some wrong turn type if anyone's seen the wrong turn movie or whatever some wrong turn stuff oh it was 
you know, look, that was a basement of horrors. You, you know, <laughs> your flower, you flower know evil reminded... to me was like that's a that was a scary basement with that cage. Like you know, the flower yep. evil basement was not a good place to be. It also reminded me of the Princess Bride. Yeah, basement. so yeah, this, this the pit of dis- the pit of despair. This drama, or yeah, this this basement wins bad basement. <laughs> like it does, it does, it, it beats it beats Flower of Evil. It beats all. I mean, because he had instruments there specifically meant to just cut off body parts and then for him to save and then again the octopus who the poor thing it's exploding out of that tiny tank like <laughs> like free willy octopus you know <laughs> uh, yeah and it was it was ex- uh, well and i remember when they like they we didn't know what was quite was in the basement yet uh, but they show that the little girl had to go down there and you hear this like weird bubbling and i was like what is <laughs> down there like i was like is this like the 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 wax you know the movie where he turns everyone into wax here's my question is that he goes into the basement she goes in the basement he takes her down because she's like when auntie died like she didn't do any of the gross things that you're meant to do when you die like she didn't like poop her pants and like her face looked fine so like had he take what had he, he do taken to her, her and done there. horrible things, then hung her? Because that was like that's what I'm yeah. thinking. That's what I'm thinking. Oh, he did, but he clearly didn't cut off any fingers. No, I think he, he cut off things that, that you so... couldn't see under her dress. Oh, gross! Oh, gross! Oh, uncle! I'm because so he's like, I'm going to show you mm-hmm. why she why she didn't look like that, and also wasn't it also like, and so you know what'll happen to you if you ever Run try and leave. Yeah. <laughs> I did like the whole like cigarette thing. I thought that was kind of cool. How he obviously he smoked the last of his like good cigarettes on the way because he knew where yeah, he was going. He had his suicide. So that cigarettes. he only had the. <laughs> yeah, he only had like the suicide cigarettes. What he said, magnesium, mercury, mercury. mercury. That's it. Wrong M, element. Um, yeah. I mean, ugh, worst piece look, ever. I think it would have been on the nose, but I do wish we had it was as they died i would have loved to have seen that octopus just bubble out of the tank and just start to like yeah feast i would have been fine with that yeah, actually could. he could have eaten his dick that would have been <laughs> <laughs> it actually would have been like i would have been fine with that at that point oh they yeah. were i mean the count sucked and the uncle was just horrific like a nightmare right yeah, I mean, ugh. I just love how the women outsmarted outsmarted them. I mean, that was the best. And the, and the fact that we got a happily ever after, which I wasn't expecting, made me so delighted. Like, I woke up the next day and I was like, I wish I could watch more of that. Like, I, I, I you know, I mean, it was perfect as a movie, but I'm just saying I could have actually lived in, like, their world for a little bit longer. Where they're like happy and they yeah, get and their rich as shit. Like she gets all her money, and she gets to keep all her oh, power. Yeah. And um, honestly, she looked great. Uh, Hideko was a hot little man. She it was, was. kind of like MC One vibes. <laughs> yeah. No, I. You know, it's great. A lot of times, you know, I say sometimes historicals aren't my thing, and and a big part of that is because I I understand the conflicts are very good, but I. Yeah, it's always frustrating to me to see how, like, women and minorities are treated. That's always just, like, oh, so frustrating for me. So this felt like, it felt like, re- I loved it because it was, the op- like, we see these women get revenge. Like, we see these women And the triumph, depressing thing is patriarchy like is very much still here. It doesn't feel dated. It yeah, doesn't feel right. dated. <laughs> no, it doesn't. Well, it feels like this, it, it felt pretty timeless to me. Yeah, I, I I thought it was great. I'm you know I'm glad Leah that you watched it first and posited it as a, an option in Patreon. Thank you to Patreon for for choosing it. Yeah, like yeah, choosing it because then we finally got it on our schedule and it was truly truly I loved it, loved it so much. And now I know why Leah was like, guys, watch it. Now I get it. But it is one of those where you can't talk about the story because no. it ruins it. So you just have to be like, just trust me. It's got story and it's got scissoring. <laughs> and the scissoring, you know, a rich debate on, you know, right. If it's gratuitous or not. But like I said, I'm sticking with the torque. <laughs> Try it at home. Let us know. I loved it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 
All right. Well, on that note. <laughs> <laughs> on a scissoring note. <laughs> Thanks for listening, everybody. Yep. Till next time. Annyeong. Kamsamnida. Thank you for listening to Afternoon of Delight. Where can you find us outside the pod? Head on over to afternoonadelight.com. That's A F T E R N O O N A D E L I G H T dot com. You'll find links to all our social media, our book recs, K pop and K skincare recs, and if you want even more Afternoon of Delight, because really who doesn't, you can join our Patreon, where you can choose the patron level that's right for you. Join in daily K drama conversations, listen to bonus podcast episodes just for patrons, and participate in our monthly live K drama support group via Zoom. We can't wait for you to be a part of the community. Until next time, Annyeong!